Welcome to S1. In this video, we're looking at correlation and regression. Now, correlation you have met previously at IGCSE and possibly even before that. So you should be well aware of this, for example, being a positive correlation and this being a negative correlation and you know depending on how close these are to that kind of straight line you know depends on how strong yeah how strong a correlation that is sorry I just had to make a correction there didn't even write positive right but yeah depending on how close you know if I've got these a bit more spread out it might be a weak positive correlation again it could be a strong positive correlation and obviously where things are just all over the place would be no correlation okay however there are some that you know can show up as say a form of correlation in some way but it won't be anything that we can kind of detect so you know something like this clearly producing some sort of circle but in terms of what we're looking at in terms of correlation and regression, all of ours are going to be linear. So we're only going to be able to work with and detect ones that form a linear correlation and regression. So like a straight line. So things like this, where there's clearly a pattern there, those are going to be ones that uh, we're not going to be able to look at or do in this particular unit uh, not going to be involved in S1 at all. Now on the axes is quite important in terms of which way round these are written. So on the x-axis is our independent variable. Okay this is the one that's set independently of the other variable and on the y-axis is our dependent variable. This is the one whose values we get from the independent one. So, for example, if I think of, oh, even the examples that are possibly in your textbooks, you know, there's one that says, in a study of a city, the population density in people per hectare and the distance from the city centre in kilometres was investigated. So, the distance from the center is my independent variable. That's the bit that I start out with, right? So at this distance from the city center, then I see what the population density is there. So the population density is the one that's dependent on that distance, not the other way around. So hopefully that makes sense. You know, it's, it's obvious you set the distance first and then you look at the population density at that distance. So that is kind of the, so that is the independent and then the dependent, the bit that you've done afterwards. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Now, this bit is quite straightforward. So let's look at a quick example. So here we have uh, Donald was interested to see if there's a relationship between the value of a house and the speed of his internet connection. And the speed is measured by the time taken to download a 100 megabyte file. And here is our results. Okay, so draw a scatter diagram to represent this data. That's my first step. That's the easiest step, I suppose, as well, for these types of questions. Now, in terms of independent and dependent uh, data, sometimes it's not obvious. What I would say is if it's not obvious, um, usually that first line is your X and the second line is often your Y. And that's probably 99% of the questions. So, you know, you can always pretty much go with that. And don't forget, when you're doing this, you need to look at what your values are. So we need to go as high as 16, and we need to be able to do these decimals. And if we look through here, our largest value is 310, and two, so it's 175 is my smallest value there. Okay, so I need to make sure I can fit these in as well. So here we have 
my graph. Um, I must apologize, just I haven't got proper graph paper for my background. So I've had to spread these out like this. Normally I'd probably like to go up in fives or something here on actual graph paper. But nevertheless, and then it's just a matter of just plotting the points. So, you know, 5.2 and 300 would be that. And then I want to plot the next one, 5.5 and 310 would be that and so on. And what you should be able to see from this is that there is a very slight negative correlation. So the pattern is in this direction. Okay, so say it was a weak negative correlation. Okay, very straightforward. Now for part C. It says that his, Donald says his data shows that a slow internet connection reduces the value of a house. We need to give a reason why Donald's conclusion may not be valid. And there are lots of reasons, aren't there? I mean, we could also talk about, you know, the higher the value house, the more likely a higher income of owner who might pay for a better internet connection. Okay, so that's kind of bringing in a third variable. Again, it could be to do with the distance from like a major built up area, because you know, often the distance you are further away from like the centers of city and stuff like that. Often then the internet connections and your telephone lines and so on can also be um, weaker and not as good as well. So, you know, essentially what you need to do is find a, a kind of a third variable that could also be affecting these and just talk about that so like you know distance from a center and stuff like that or you know the uh, the income of the owner or things like that any kind of thing like that will do there any valid reason now the start of this it, it is really straightforward this chapter but the start is really easy so i'm just going to give you one question um, I'll go through the answer and then we'll pop on to the next bit. So, first part of this example is to show that R equals 22.3 is an outlier. So all I need to do about that is look at what we're doing here. So my interquartile range is going to be Q3 minus Q1. Okay, so Q3 is 4.9 and Q1 is 0 0.1, so this gives me 4.8. And then I want to do 1.5 multiplied by my interquartile range, and that gives me 7.2. So we've got like Q1 minus 7.2. That's going to take me into the negative, so, you know, I'm not going to worry about that there. And then Q3 plus 7.2. So that is going to be my 4.9 plus 7.2, which is 12.1. So that's my limit. So everything now above 12.1 is an outlier. Okay, hence... R equals 22.3 is an outlier. Now, for part B, we need to think about why we might include this data and why we might not. So, in terms of including it, there's nothing to suggest that it is incorrect. It's been collected in an incorrect way. So, you know, that data has got to be real. And then in terms of excluding it, if it's an outlier, then there's a chance that it's not representative of the typical rainfall. You know, we are talking about here August, and that's quite a lot of rain for the summer. So, you know, that is a reason why it might be an outlier and why we would exclude it from the data. 
you just kind of have to think of it as like sometimes there can be like freak weather that just happens what at a time when it doesn't normally happen so that's why you're kind of thinking about we you know it's an outlier should we remove it so for part c we need to draw a scatter diagram but we're gonna be removing that piece of data so these are the values now we're drawing and you can see you know we need to go as high as 6.8 on the x-axis and as high as 10.5 on the y and here we have my diagram hopefully you can see that okay um it's not perfect but uh, i really struggle to draw the graphs in this way you know it's, in real life it's a lot easier i did this one in real life but then the the picture doesn't always come out as well but what we can see for part d in this question is that there's clearly no correlation okay there's nothing between the two there so part e says do you think there's a casual relationship between the amount of rain and the hours of sunshine on a particular day explain your reasoning i do i think there is a casual relationship if you think about it logically for it to rain we need clouds and if there are clouds there's going to be less sunshine so there's got to be a casual relationship between the two you know equally you could think of like if i've got a lot of sunshine i've probably got less clouds which means less chance of rain okay either way around you know you're thinking about it but that would give you that casual relationship so i've just put that into words but it makes sense it's just a logical thing you know there isn't a correlation between the two because you know we're talking about uh, edinburgh which is in scotland so there's going to be lots of days where there are clouds and no rain okay so that's why we don't get um, an actual correlation between the two but there is a bit of a casual relationship because when there is more rain there will be more clouds therefore less sunshine so the next thing we're looking at is linear regression and how to calculate it now what this essentially is is like a line of best fit something like this so imagine you know i've got points like this and i draw a line of best fit through it okay this is my regression line and it's all about the distances that each of these points are from this line so the distance these points are from that line okay that's what's really important about what we're looking at here now this line is often called the least squares regression line and essentially it kind of comes from well if i am looking at these distances that each of my points is from the line and essentially finding an average distance for each of these the distance above might be a positive and the distance it is below might be a negative okay which can really mess up with when i'm just trying to find my average distance from the line so what we're actually end up doing is we're squaring those distances to keep them positive okay and that's where it kind of gets its name from and the line is basically the line that gives the minimum distance from those points which is why you get this perfect kind of average line now that bit you know you don't need to worry about so much but we will talk about it a bit again and this line is not quite in the form of y equals mx plus c we write it in the form of y equals a plus bx so in a way this is y equals c plus mx so we're writing it in a slightly different form where a is obviously going to be where it hits that line there and b is our gradient which then 
a bit of an obvious statement, but if B is positive, then it's a positive correlation. If B is negative, it is a negative correlation. And this line is called the regression line of Y on X. And I put this up here like this because sometimes you get questions where we're talking about different letters like G on H or H on F. And it's just important then to kind of understand what it means in terms of Y and X. So we've already talked about this equation. Let's look at how we actually work it out. So to work it out, B is SXY over SXX. Now this S just stands for a summary statistic. Okay, and I'll show you how to work these out in a second. And A, I get this from the mean of Y minus B times the mean of X. Okay, which you'll notice is from my equation here. It's just this kind of rearranged, but I'm looking at the mean values of these. Okay, which, you know, as I was talking about earlier, this is like that kind of average line. So this makes sense. Now, how do I get my summary statistics? So these are as follows. So S, X, Y is the sum of X, Y minus the sum of X times the sum of Y divided by N. And then the others are very much the same. S, X, X. Just remember, it would just be the same as replacing this y by x, so x and x. Which is why it's the sum of x squared minus the sum of x squared divided by n. And you probably guessed what s s s y y is. Sum of y squared minus the sum of y squared divided by n. Now, sometimes these are given to you, or some of these values are given to you. Sometimes you have to work them out, but uh, we'll go through all that now when we do our first example. So here we have our first example. We've got a table of values, but we don't need to work out these values as they're given to us already in the table. Okay, so some of N would just be obviously adding up all these values. Some of P would be adding up these values. Some of N squared would be each one squared and added up. Obviously P would be each one squared and added up. And some of NP is multiplied and added together. Okay, so these are given for you. It does often come that way, but not always. Now, I will also show you how you can put this into your calculator to get these values. I'll do that at the end of this question. So part A, sum of, or summary statistic SNN is gonna be the sum of N squared minus the sum of N squared over N. So that is 30, 1,786 minus 540 squared over, and then I just want to count how many I've got. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, which is over 12. And that gives me 6,486. And then I do the same for SPP. Now, to go further into part B, I'm also going to need to work out S of NP.
Now that I have that, I can go ahead and work out my value of B. So B will be SNP divided by SNN. So that's going to be my 6344 divided by 6486. Which to three significant figures is 978 0.978. Next I need to find my value of A, and this is the mean of Y minus B times the mean of X. So the mean of Y is gonna be well in this case I say mean of Y, it should be mean of P and the mean of n for my x and my y. So mean of p is going to be my sum of p, which is 780 divided by n, which we know is 12, minus b, which we have just found, and the sum of, sorry, the mean of n is going to be the sum of n divided by 12. Just a quick point on that, you know, the mean of say x or the mean of y is just your total of those values divided by how many values you've got that's what we're doing here and that gives me that a is 20 point and we've got 985 here so i'm just going to leave it as 99 at the moment to two decimal places but of course i am storing all my values in my calculator for these, I like to store B as B and A as A, just to make my life a little bit easier. And now we can write our equation. So P equals uh, 21 plus 0.978N. Okay, or 21.0 if I wanna just keep it in terms of three significant figures. Okay, now part C. Now here we've got 40,000 items. So my items is N and it's in the thousands. So that means it will be, N will be 40 for 40,000 items. And all I need to do is substitute this into my equation to find P. And that gives me 60.1094 and so on. So thinking of this now, remember that P is also in terms of thousands. So we're looking at 60,110, okay, or 60,109, or even if we're looking at three significant figures as we have been doing 60,100 uh, euros. Now part D asks us to comment on the reliability. So our value earlier of n equals 40 is in our range of values. If you look at the table our smallest value of n was 21. Sorry, it was actually 12. Our smallest value was 12. Our largest value there being 81. So that's our range of values. 40 is within that range. Because it's within that range, it means it's a reliable estimate. Okay, it only becomes unreliable if it falls outside of my range of possible values and there we have it written down so just to think just to recap this it's reliable if it falls within your range of data it becomes unreliable as it goes outside your range of data and the further outside the range of data is the less reliable it becomes now I'm going to give you a question to try on this and uh, go through the answer afterwards.
Now B is my gradient, so it's about what my gradient means. And in this case, you've always got to rely it, relay it back to the question. So in this case, it would be the number of years of protection per coat of paint because that's what the gradient is when we're multiplying here x was my coats of paint so multiplying by that number of coats of paint that's what we're looking at that gradient there now part c as i discussed in the example when we're talking about reliability seven years falls outside my range my range of data is one to five years seven years lies outside of this range and as i said as well previously the further outside that range the less reliable it is but in this case we're explaining why it would not be a suitable model or not be suitable to predict so we just need to state about this part here and there you have it just putting it into a sentence unreliable as seven codes lies outside the range of data so part d then is use our answer to part a which is how y equals 0 0.07 plus 1.45 x to predict the number of years of protection when seven coats of paint are applied. So y equals 0 0.07, so negative that, plus 1.45 times by my seven. And here we get 10.08 years. So to further improve the reliability, the lab made two further observations so now what we need to do is using all seven data points producing new model now i won't go through this again but it's just the same process as you did earlier but you need to add these two additional points in so this will give me a new value of a which is 0 0.47786 and so on and we've got so i'll round that Four seven two seven nine four significant figures there, and then B is one point two four six seven. It does carry on two one three and so on, but again we'll do the same two four six seven. Actually, making it four significant figures one point two four seven. So my new model is 0 0.4779 plus 1.247B. Apologies, X. Now we have to use this model to get a new prediction for seven codes. So when X equals seven, we go 0 0.4779 plus 1.247 multiplied by seven. And that will give me 9.2 years. Give two reasons why your new prediction might be more accurate than your original. Well, quite simply, uh, seven years now falls within our data. Okay, so that makes it more reliable. Okay, that's called interpolation. So within the data, Okay, is called interpolation. Outside of that data is called extrapolation. So think of it like this. We've got a load of values, you know, our X values and so on. And we've got this line of kind of best fit. Okay, now up to and including my smallest and largest value, this line is quite accurate. But if I have to extrapolate this line further, it becomes less accurate. So this kind of part, or even going in the other way, is called extrapolation. And where I take a value within my data, 
is called interpolation, which you would have been doing on one of the earlier chapters when you were finding like quartiles and medians, you were interpolating, if you remember. Okay, and that's what it's all about. So my first reason is that now that seven years is interpolation. It's within my data set. Okay, so that's my first reason. That's my first reason written down there. And then my second reason is we've increased the number of data points we've taken. Okay, more data means more accuracy. Okay, you know, if you've only taken one or two pieces of data, it's not very accurate. You know, the more pieces of data you take, the more accurate your prediction would be. And there we have it. Okay, so there are my two reasons why my new prediction is more accurate than my original prediction. Now, before we head on to the last bit, which is the product moment correlation coefficient, which is quite important, we do need to talk very briefly about coding. Okay, we've done coding in previous chapters, and coding can apply to the values that we deal with here and our equation. So, in this example here, let's work out our first regression line. So, B is our SXY over SXX. So, 120 over 240. So, we can see that's a half. And our A is the mean of Y minus B times the mean of X. So, 6 minus a half times 5. And that's going to be 3.5. So y equals 3.5 plus 0.5x. There is my regression line. Now let's have a look at the coding. So it tells me that x equals c over 2 and y equals d over 10. So if I want to find this regression line, it's simply a matter of substituting these values in. So d over 10 is equal to 3.5 plus 0.5 multiplied by c over 2. So you've got now, if we multiply through by 10, we get 35 plus 2.5c. And there we have our new regression line where the coding is involved. In terms of using the coding, you know, substituted into your regression line will give you your new regression line. Equally, if you find in values in terms of X or Y originally, you just need to substitute them into either coding to get the additional value. So, you know, if you substitute X equals something in to get Y, once you've got that y, you just substitute in here and you'll get that d. Or when you've got your x, you substitute in here, rearrange and you get that c in this case. So you can use the, the coding with the original one as well, with the original values. Or you can always create your new regression line as well. So a couple of options there. Um, I'll give you one question on this and then we'll move on. Okay, for this question here, I need to first work out all my sums. So my sum of x is obviously going to be adding these values up. Sum of y will be adding these up and so on, as we discussed before. And then sum of x, y is the sum of x, y, minus the sum of x times the sum of y over n, and n is 5.
Now, for changing our regression line to C on A, all we need to do is substitute our two pieces of coding in here. So that means we get C over 5 equals 7.87 plus 0 0.850 A minus 8 over 2. And then what we need to do is simply rearrange this and kind of sort it out. So, you know, I would probably start here by multiplying through by 10. That will get rid of my two on the bottom or my five on the bottom there. Now, I'm using not this value, but I'm using my full value of B um, from my calculator here. Okay, so when I multiplied this divided by two, times 10 or just this times 5 this is what I'm getting okay so it's very important that you do that um, I'll just skip now to the kind of answer again I was also using my full value here although I put the rounded one in there okay you need the full values just to get them right here these are the three significant figures um, you do need to go more than three significant figures in the question if you want to round the three significant figures in the answer. Okay, so it's important that you do more decimal places or more significant figures in your working out. If you use the rounded values from part A, I think the only difference is that this will be 22.4 rather than 22.3 and it's just because that next value um, would have been a 5 from the rounded data but it isn't from the non-rounded data okay so there would have been a slight difference there now for part c we've got an area of 32 so i can just substitute that straight into here and get c equals 22.3 plus 2.13 times that 32 and this gives me 90 dollars and 40 cents obviously here um rounding off we are we are dealing with money but we've rounded off the three significant figures as that is what was in my question now this is obviously one way of doing it if for the question i didn't have to do this part then I could have converted that using this in terms of x, put it into the original equation, not this one, sorry, this equation, to find y, and then substitute it in here to find c. Okay, so it is a little bit more long-winded, but if you didn't have to find this for b, then it would probably be quicker. Now, final thing to look at in this chapter or unit is the product moment correlation coefficient, or R. Okay, sometimes you'll see it abbreviated as PMCC in your textbooks and your notes. And it's very simple. It gives me the linear correlation between two variables. And it'll also give me the strength of that correlation. So it's measured between minus 1 and 1. And it's calculated by using our summary statistics. So SXY over SXX multiplied by SYY and then square rooted. And what you will see from this is that the summary statistic of the x, y is what determines whether we're going to have a positive or negative correlation. Now, as we've just been looking at coding, what I can say is that in general, for you guys doing S1, coding is not going to change your value of R. Okay? To be more specific, as long as the coding is linear, as in your adding, subtracting, or multiplying or dividing by values. Okay, so as long as it's linear coding, then it is gonna not affect R. And that is the type that we do in S1. Okay, so for the purposes of S1, your coding is not gonna affect R, but it is linear coding, okay? 
um, and that's what we're talking about. Now, in terms of R, you know, if I've got essentially a perfect positive correlation, R would equal 1. Again, you know, if I had a perfect negative correlation, something like this, R would equal minus 1. And then, you know, there are variations of that, you know, in terms of, like, the stronger this correlation is, the closer it is. So in this case, there's a positive one. This will be close to 1, okay? Whereas if I added some extra values on, and this was a bit more maybe spread out, something like that, then it wouldn't be as close to 1, but it would still be, you know, a positive value. When r equals 0, there is no linear correlation. Okay? So we are talking about linear correlation. If you remember, I did mention to you earlier you know, you can get some sort of correlation when you've got that pattern, like this, for example, would give me zero, no linear correlation, but clearly there is a correlation there. So it's just to be aware of, it's no linear correlation, so it's about getting that um, straight line. So in terms of the range, just to kind of recap, the closer it is to 1, the closer it is to that kind of perfect positive correlation. The closer it is to minus 1, again, the closer it is to that perfect negative correlation. And then 0 is no correlation. So like a low positive number would perhaps be a weak positive correlation. A small negative number, like say 0 0.1 or something, 0 0.2, you know, these would be weak negative correlations. Okay, so essentially the closer to zero it is, the, the worse the correlation would be. And finally, it's worth noting that while you can get a correlation or value for it between two variables, you have to use your common sense as to whether those variables are actually correlating between each other. What I mean by that is, for example, just because, say, the number of cars on the road has increased and the number of TVs bought has decreased. It doesn't mean that if you change one, it'll affect the other because those two things clearly aren't going to be affected by each other. And that's where you have to bring in your common sense. Okay. Whereas if I was talking about, like, say, the age of a car and its value, well, those things would affect each other. Okay, obviously there can be outliers and we've got classic cars and things like that. But in general, you know, like the older the car, the less valuable it would be. So those things would correlate and the one would affect the other one. So it's important to use your common sense. So quick example here. First step is just to find S of a a which is nice and easy sum of a squared minus sum of a squared over n so sum of a squared is 1899 and then we've got 115 squared over 7 as there were 7 members and this gives me 68 over 7 or 9.71 Four in terms of uh, rounding that to uh, three decimal places. Now we can go ahead and find R, my product moment correlation coefficient. So it's going to be S of AH over the square root SAA times SHH. H. So it's just a matter now of substituting all my values in. So we've got, you know, our AA we just found, which is that 9 point. I'm going to keep the full fraction there, 68 over 7, times 571.4.
and I get 0 0.9677 this is the four decimal places all significant figures so what we can say here is we've got a positive, a strong positive correlation. Now we should also put that in the context of the question. And that means that the greater the age of the person, the taller the person. Of course, we know that this is only based on these seven people and this data. You know, it wouldn't work for everyone because there's a point where you stop growing, isn't there? Now, give you a couple of questions to try on this, and as always, I'll pop the answers at the end. So, first thing I've done here is take my table here and redraw it. Next, what I need to do then is just put in my X and my Y and then start working out my values. So my x value is n take away 365. So 380 minus 365 is 15. 402 minus 365 is 37. And then repeating that process for each of my values, I get these values of x. Next, to work out y, we need to do s minus 530. So the first one is 560 minus 530 is 30. 543 minus 530 is 13. And then again, repeating this pattern or this process for each of my remaining values. Now that I've done that, I need to calculate my summary statistics. Okay, and to do that, let's start off with our sum of x. So remember, sum of x is adding up my x values. I don't need to explain this. I'll just pop the answers up now. Now we've got these, I can find my summary statistics for each of these. So s, x, x. Again, I'm just going to jump to the answers and I'm just going to round these off. So 1601. Let's do y, y is one two eight two and x y is minus eight nine nine you can see with this one's minus it is going to mean it's a negative um, correlation if there is a correlation part b is to find the product moment correlation coefficient which is r and we know this is s x y over the square root of my SXX times my SYY. And this will give me minus 0 0.627. Now, part C says state with a reason whether or not the shopkeeper was correct. Well, the shopkeeper's incorrect, isn't he? It's a negative correlation. That means as one increases, the other decreases. Very straightforward there, hopefully it makes sense. Now for the final, final part C here, we can see it's a strong positive correlation. And that does mean that John is correct. What we do need to do is make sure we just kind of refer it to the question a little bit. And there we have it. Okay, anything along those kind of lines. Now, I'm gonna do a video coming up shortly. Just uh, everything we did today you know, some of this stuff I actually did in my calculator, you know, from the tables. I put the values into my calculator and let it do all the work for me. So I will make a, a short video on this and I do need to still make one on the normal distribution in the calculator. So those will be coming shortly. 
if you've enjoyed this video or well maybe you didn't enjoy this video because maybe you find in all the pressure of studying maths hard at this point but if you found the video at least useful helpful you know and you haven't subscribed to me so far please hit that subscribe button uh, it really does help me out and don't forget to comment down below you know if you spot something if you want to ask a question or if you just want to say thank you you know just hit the comments down below and hit that like button thanks for watching